This is chapter 25, and I realize the chapters are jumping around. We're following the format that the other anatomy and physiology instructors use, and this is the way they feel flows, the information flows better. The way the book is organized is like the traditional way all the books are organized, so I don't know. We're doing, we're doing what we can. Okay, so water balance. So in general, total, total water for a 150-pound male is about 40 liters, so it's about 65% of their total, um, total weight is um, water. Now, when you look at fluid content and how much water we actually have, it depends on gender. Okay, so females have more body fat. Um, body fat, if you compare muscle, at how much water is in muscle and how much water is in fat, that's 20% water and muscle 75% water. So females have more body fat because that's the way we're built to, um, to keep the babies alive. So we tend to have less, we have more body fat, so we have less water. Um, the picture, this water percent, so we, in humans, we range from 45% to 75%. And they're saying that the male, the average male, is about 65%. Um, infants have more water and elderly have less water, okay? So elderly, both of these age brackets are gonna be people who are really, really susceptible to dehydration. So if they get diarrhea or vomiting or they're not drinking, both of those groups are, should be, are gonna be really susceptible to dehydration, okay? So it's all about um, weight and body composition. So this is, this is the important thing. Now, um, we want to talk about the fluid compartments, and I'm pretty sure you guys are know this from Bio 103. So when you look at Bio 103, um, you learned about intracellular fluid, so that's the fluid within the cells, so we call that ICF. So if here's a cell, the ICF is what's inside the cell. What's outside the cell is the ECF. So that's the extracellular fluid. Okay, so we go by these rules of thirds. So someone came up with this way to remember it. Um, the idea is two-thirds of the water is in the cell. Okay, so most of it's in the cell. One-third of it is outside of the cell. So most of the water in your body at any one time has is inside of your cells. 35% um, is found in the extracellular fluid, or the ECF. Okay, now, you can break this 35% and break it up again, and what we're going to find is interstitial fluid. Okay, so the fluid that's in the tissue. So interstitial is, is within the tissue. Okay, so, or between cells. Okay, that's the interstitial fluid. It's two-thirds of this 35 percent. And then intravascular, okay, so this is what's in the vessels, right? So this is in the vessels, is one-third of this. Okay, so that's another two-thirds. So there's one one-third rule and then there's another one-third rule or third rule of thirds is what they call it. Okay, so those those are important. Okay, now within the fluids, okay, we're going to have different distributions of ions and electrolytes. Okay, so the fluid within the cell has more potassium, more magnesium, more phosphate, and more proteins. Okay, now within the extracellular fluid, we're going to have more sodium, calcium, chloride, and um, bicarbonate. Now, we will go back and go over these several times. Okay, so the main thing that you should get from this slide is you should get these rules of thirds. Okay, know where it's distributed. And you understand what intracellular is, what in extracellular is what interstitial is, what intravascular is.
Okay, now here's the ions. Where are the ions? Okay, so the ions, if we look at this picture, okay, and this is what I have typed on the last page, okay, and it's also in your book on a chart on page 991, okay. What you're going to see, so this is trying to show you, this image is showing you, okay, here's the blood vessels. Here's blood vessels. Okay, here's outside the fluid. Okay, and then there's within the cell. So if we go up here and we look what's in with, in the cell, okay, you're going to have potassium, magnesium, phosphate, And then negatively, I'm going to make it like this, negatively charged proteins. Okay, these are in a higher concentration within the cell. So these are in the cell. So you need to remember those are the ones that are more plentiful inside the cell. Okay, now... In the extracellular fluid, the ions that we're looking for, we're looking for sodium, calcium, chloride, carbonate, and no protein, very little protein. Okay, so you're going to need to know where these ions should normally be. Okay, so that's going to take a little bit of memorizing, but you need to know where the ions should be. So you need to know these are the ones that are higher in the cell. These are higher outside the cell. And what I would do personally is I would draw myself a picture just like this, and I'd practice labeling it or come up with a little trick with the, um, with the ions to remember it. And I don't have, I don't have a trick to do it or I would tell you and I don't see one in the book either so what you guys will have to be creative and come up with it okay now how does the water move within the compartments okay so how does it move and this is this you guys know this because this is very this is very common sense okay so and you've been doing it for a long time so this should just be a review okay so if you drink right you're gonna you're going to drink water, okay, and the water is going to go into the digestive system, right? And then from the digestive system, it's going to move to the blood. Okay, so it's going to go from the blood. Okay, and then from the blood, okay, it's going to move to the, um, to the fluid outside the blood, and then it'll move into the cell. So the idea is we're moving from, if we're drinking... Okay, we're moving from the, from the blood to the cells. So we're hydrating the cells. I have, I have a weird, I'm trying to find a better stylus. There, this one's better. The last one was sticking on the thing. So we're hydrating the cells. Okay, now, if you're dehydrated, what's going to happen is our body wants to keep our blood volume up and keep our blood pressure up and keep keep us you know functioning making ATP. So what happens is we're going to take fluid from the cells, right? And it's going to move to the blood. So the cells will start to shrivel if you're dehydrated. So it's going to move the other way. So it's all depends on hypertonic and hypotonic and that that makes sense. I think you guys are okay with hypo and hypertonic. Okay, so hypertonic means you have more solvents, solutes, yeah, I can't spell, and um, less water. And hypotonic means you have less solutes or dissolved substances and more water. Okay, so when you're dehydrated, your blood is becoming hypertonic, and the water will move from hot from hypo to hyper. Okay, so here's um, a picture that explains the types of water loss that we experience and how we gain water. 
So we gain water two ways. So one is preformed. So preformed water is what we're going to obtain in, in drink and food. So it's what we're going to get when we eat and drink. So typically we get um, 1.6 liters or 1,600 milliliters of drink a day and about 700 milliliters in our food. And then metabolic water... This is water that's a byproduct of all the biochemical pathways in our body. So this is water that we make. Okay, so we're making metabolic water no matter what. Okay, now whenever we lose water, we lose it either by expired air. Okay, so when we exhale, there's always some water moisture in that air. So we use about 300 milliliters of it. Um, we lose some through sweat. Okay, cutaneous transpiration. So cutaneous transpiration, this is water loss that's coming through our skin that's not sweat. Okay, it's just we're losing, we lose water through our skin is just evaporation. So think about if you put your your hands on the lab table or your arm on the lab table, it's that cold slate. If you put your put your arm on there and you lift it up, the table's gonna look wet. It's not because you're sweating, it's cutaneous transpiration. So it's water that's just coming, it comes off our skin and it, it just happens. Okay, we don't have any control over it. Okay, so then we have feces that makes sense. Um, urine, so we have two different kinds of urine production. So we have obligatory and facultative. Okay, so obligatory means that's the minimum urine output that we need to survive. Okay, so obligatory is the minimum output. Okay, facultative, that's extra. So if you're drinking lots, you're gonna have more, you're gonna have more urine output. So if you're maintaining, you're drinking your water like they tell you to, and not just drinking coffee, um, then we're, we will lose that. Okay, now, if you look over here in these boxes, you're gonna see some words. So insensible, sensible, obligatory, and facultative. Okay, so if you look here, okay, Expired air, sweat, and cutaneous transpiration are all insensible water loss. Okay, so insensible water loss means that we it's hard to measure. Okay, so it's not measurable. So let's put that here. Insensible. Not measurable. Okay, we can't measure it. And we don't have any control through it, over it. It's going to happen no matter what you do. As long as you're breathing and you're existing, you're going to lose that air. Or not air, that water. You're going to lose that water. Okay, so that's, that's insensible. Okay, now sensible is measurable. Okay, so like you can figure out how much fluid's in your poop. You could feel how you could catch it in a in a, um, like the little hat they put on the toilet, right? You can measure it, or you can measure it in a bag. Okay, sensible, um, it's measurable. Okay, so that's, that's the difference between insensible and sensible. Okay, now obligatory, okay, is, it, it's unavoidable. It's good, you're obligated to do it. Okay, so it it doesn't matter if you're on a ship, if in or if you're like shipwrecked, and you're floating in life raft in the ocean without any fresh water, you are going to have air water in your expired air. You're going to have it in your sweat. It's going to come out through your feces if you're still pooping, and you're going to have to make some with your urine. Okay, so. You have to have that much urine in order to get rid of the waste. Okay, now facultative is, um, let me see, let me write it down here. 
Facultative is um, controlled water loss. Okay, so it's it depends on how hydrated you are. I'm running out of room. It depends on how hydrated you are. Okay, and it depends on your hormones. Okay, so the hormones are going to regulate it. So if you are dehydrated and you're in the life raft, right, you're going to be able to control this facultative water loss. Okay, so your hormones in your body are going to try to hold on to as much water as possible so that you don't die. Okay, so those definitions you need to understand and you need to understand where the water's coming from, where we're getting it, the difference between preformed and metabolic, okay, and then the difference between the routes of, the routes of loss. Okay, so fluid output is dependent on what's going on in your body. Okay, that's obvious, right? So it depends on the environment and whether you're active. Um, okay, so one thing that people don't realize lots of times is that it's easy to get dehydrated when it's cold. So because the air is so dry when it's cold, it, it's easy to get dehydrated then, too. So it's important, like if you're skiing or sled riding, that you're not just um, drinking coffee. You need to be drinking water, too. Okay, so here, this is just reinforces what we said on the last slide. So insensible water loss is not measurable. Sensible is measurable, so that's urine and feces. I don't want to measure that. I don't want to personally measure the feces <laughs> loss. Um, obligatory, it's going to happen no matter what's going on. Okay, so it and it's to get rid of toxins so that you don't go into azotemia and have problems with the your um, nitrogen compounds building up in your blood. Okay, so facultative is controlled, so it depends on your state of hydration. So I'm just putting what was on the last slide into text. Okay, now, fluid fluid imbalances with constant osmolarity. Okay, so let's talk about when you have problems, what's, what's going on. Okay, so constant osmolarity means that the the amount of solutes in the blood is not changing. Okay, so the blood is staying isotonic. Okay, so everything is staying is staying equal. Okay, so we're not losing solutes with um without water. We're losing everything altogether. Okay, so the first one is um, volume depletion, which they also call hypovolemia. So hypovolemia is caused by um, hemorrhaging. So if you're hemorrhaging, you're losing, you're losing blood, right? So you're losing the plasma, oh shoot, the plasma and the solids. So you're you, you're losing everything. Okay, you're not just you losing water. You're losing the stuff that's in the blood too. Okay, um, you could have severe burns. If you're vomiting, you're losing the stuff, diarrhea, and then if something's wrong with your aldosterone levels. Okay, now, um, we'll talk about aldosterone again. Okay, now, volume excess, okay, this occurs if you are um, gaining water and you are keeping the concentration constant. Okay, so you're trying to keep everything constant. So you're retaining sodium and you're retaining water. Okay, so when this happens, this can be um, with if you're making too much aldosterone. Okay, so it would be a problem with the adrenal cortex or if someone's in renal failure, that can occur. Okay, so the idea is there's no change in osmolarity. Okay, so everything is isotonic. Okay, now, if we're changing the osmolarity, we're losing water or we're gaining solutes. We're not changing one of the, we're not changing them together. Okay, so an example of a fluid imbalance with changes in osmolarity is dehydration. Okay, so if you have profuse sweating, okay, you're losing water, but you're not losing all the salts that are in there. 
um, diabetes mellitus, you have excessive urination, but you're not losing the solids that are in there. Okay, so hypersecretion of antidiuretic hormone, if you're not drinking enough, or if you're overexposed to cold water, all of those things can cause dehydration. So what happens is the blood will become hypertonic and the fluid's going to move from the cells to the blood. Okay, now this can cause you to go into um, circulatory shock. It could cause you to get really confused and it can cause death in infants. What in the world? Okay, so I'm trying to figure out why this looks like this. Um, fluid changes with with um, the opposite way. Okay, so hypotonic hydration. So it is possible to drink too much water. Okay, so sometimes they call it water intoxication or they call it a positive water balance. Okay, so one thing that can cause that is antidiuretic hormone if you're making too much of that. Um, another thing is drinking too much plain water after excessive sweating. So an example of that is if um, you're running a marathon, okay, or you're doing a triathlon or something like that, and instead of drinking like the Gatorade or the Powerade or whatever they're giving you, you are drinking just straight water. So you're losing more solutes or solids than you're putting back in. And what can happen is you get, you get too much water in there and you don't have enough salts. So the um, blood plasma becomes hypotonic. Okay, so if that becomes hypotonic, then um, what's going to happen is the water's going to move to the um, interstitial fluid. and to the cells. Okay, and then what will happen is it, it'll cause edema. Okay, so one of the bad things that can happen is the brain can swell. Okay, or they, they call it um, cerebral edema. Okay, so that's hypotonic hydration. It, it can cause death, okay? So a long, I don't know how many years ago, but when the Wii first came out, the video game first came out around Christmas time, a radio station did a, a, a contest they called um, Hold Your Pee for a Wii, and they had these people come in and drink gallons and gallons of water and um, to... <laughs> To win a wee. So it turns out that one of the women that did this suffered from cerebral edema and actually died because she had so much water. I've also heard cases of um, people that have mental illness um, and they've been take, taken off of drugs try to, um, to drink excess water to induce kind of a high and it, Kind of, and so that they they feel like they're they're high, but it's just from water because that's all they have access to. Okay, now fluid sequestration. So what um, that is, it's abnormally distributed body fluids. So body fluids that are not in the right place. So in your book, this is on page nine ninety four. Okay, so. Edema is the first one, and I think we've talked about this already, but what happens with edema is fluid accumulates in the space around the cell, so in the interstitial space, and it um, results in puffiness or swelling. And there's different kinds of edema. Some of it that's really bad, it's actually um, pitting, where you push, if you touch this, you push in on it, it the um, indent will stay in there. So that's, that's not good. Okay, so um, usually the things that are causing edema are, some, usually it could be a heart problem or it could be a, a lung problem, so a abnormal cardiovascular. So um, it could be congestive heart failure. There's a whole, it's all listed on this figure 25.2. 
Um, so, so any of these things could cause it. So it could be something wrong with the blood composition, so you don't have enough albumin, you might have a liver disease, or it could be something's, a lymph node is blocked. So if a lymph node is blocked, then the fluid can't return back up into here. Okay, now, one type, another type of fluid sequestration would be a hematoma. So a hematoma is kind of like a big bruise, and the blood accumulates in the tissue. So that can reduce um, blood pressure. Whoops, shoot. That can reduce blood pressure. Okay, um, pleural effusion is when fluid is accumulating in the lungs. And then ascites is when fluid actually accumulates in the abdomen, in the peritoneal cavity. Okay, so it, regular edema, right, we can see it. It's harder to see um, pleural effusion or ascites because those are deep. You have to listen to the body sounds. Okay, now I have a couple questions. So which of the following individuals is most likely to contain the largest percentage of water? Um, it should be this person. Is that right? Uh-oh. You know what? I'm thinking, okay, so let's talk through it together. So 80-year-old woman wouldn't have much. 90-year-old man. Okay, so overweight 18-year-old female. What does she have? She has an increase in body fat. I shouldn't have circled it before I thought about it. Okay, so this guy probably has the most. So it's B. It's not D. I was thinking it said she was healthy. Okay. All right. The fluid compartment with the largest percentage of fluid. So where's the most fluid? So most of the fluid should be in the cells. Okay, so that's 65%. Okay. Which of the following could cause fluid to move from the blood to the interstitial space? Okay, so let's look at this. So if this is my blood, okay, and here's cells. Okay, here's the space. Okay, so we want the blood to move, the fluid to move from here into here. Okay, if I was dehydrated, which way would it go? It would go the other way. So not dehydrated. If I was vomiting, it would um, not burn. So increased blood pressure is the best answer. Okay, those were just some practice questions.